So Shepard, Shepard was um, uh, conceived as um, uh, a, you know, a possible future for ARM, a possible way of uh, doing this asteroid uh, redirect mission in a, in a practical manner. And early in uh, uh, this year, in March, we uh, f had this paper published in uh, the journal New Space, which is a very appropriate journal for coming up with this somewhat futuristic idea. Um, it, um, it's really, uh, at its root, very simple. And the idea is that uh, an, an asteroid in microgravity uh, can be manipulated by gases. You can use gases to manipulate an asteroid. And where this idea comes from is um, I was uh, probably best known for uh, ha helping recover these uh, little pieces of an asteroid that was seen coming in, asteroid 2008 TC3. This happened back in, in 2008. And the asteroid was studied in space. We have the shape of it. We even have the orientation in which this asteroid uh, hit the Earth's atmosphere. Uh, and it hit in the, in the north of uh, Sudan over the Nubian Desert. And this is what was seen by uh, people along the Nile. This was uh, photographed by uh, cell phones, <laughs> even filmed. It's very bright because the impact happened just before dawn, in, uh, in, in morning, uh, just before morning twilight. A lot of people were on and about. Um, this is your asteroid. Most of this asteroid was deposited in the atmosphere. Just a scrap of it survived. This was a very frail asteroid, the highest, the biggest uh, um, moment of breakup happened at uh, 37 kilometers altitude. And, uh, and the, the last little poof was at 33 kilometers. So until that point, nobody had ever recovered meteorites from something that broke apart that high in the atmosphere. And, uh, uh, you know, fortunately, uh, my point of contact, uh, Maui Shadad, uh, an astronomer in, uh, in Sudan at the University of Khartoum, turned out to be a really good organizer. And he brought uh, his students with me into the desert and we went looking and we actually found pieces of it. And this was the, the first one I found, very excited about it. Uh, what struck me uh, from the very beginning was that the, the meteorites the students were finding, so we had uh, all the students lined up in a row and we were just sort of combing the desert along the path that was calculated. The meteorites that the students were finding were all different. Every time when a rock was presented to me, it looked different. And that was a stunning uh, thing, because normally with meteorite falls, pieces look alike. Uh, there is such a thing as type specimen, where you have one, you know, one meteorite characterizing you know, what came down in that fall. Th there was no type specimen for TC3. <laughs> there are at least 10 different meteorite types that uh, this uh, little asteroid contained. And all these things were in this uh, little uh, asteroid. So uh, this thing uh, was uh, very complex, which makes it a really interesting little world to go and visit. So one of uh, Michael's targets, you know, for me, uh, a great target would be asteroid TC3 when it was still in space. <laughs> because, you know, you would see the asteroid, you could see all these rocks in context. You could study the geology, you could use that to understand the processes in the early uh, solar system uh, that resulted in this weird uh, object. Uh, the other thing was, uh, you know, TC3 was a fragile object, it was a frail object, and there's a lot of frail object coming into the Earth's atmosphere. And a not a lot of that is recovered on the ground as meteorites. Uh, with TC3 we found some material that was uh, basically a very loose agglomeration of little dust specks. Just a little a pile of tiny dust grains on top of each other. That type of materials don't typically make it through the Earth's atmosphere. In this case, you know, there was a big object. This thing was four meters in size. So even when just the scrap survived, we had these interesting materials on the ground. Uh, but that's, uh, that's not what's, what's typically in, in our meteorite collections. And so when we go out in space and we visit one of these asteroids, uh, we can find materials that we are not uh, familiar with in our meteorite collections. And the most interesting ones, of course, are those that are really fragile, that are really frail. And a lot of it could be, uh, a lot of asteroids could, could be dominated by that type of materials. So um, ARM was just introduced by Michael. Uh, the idea was to, uh, you know, uh, bring one of these small asteroids closer to Earth so we could actually visit it with people. Um, the original ARM option A uh, idea was um, throw a bag around it. <laughs> Uh, grab it, hug it up to the satellite, and then uh, transport it to the Earth. 
And uh, the, you know, trouble you get into if you try and do that is that the asteroid is spinning and tumbling. And so if you throw back around the asteroid, it will, it will turn the asteroid around. It will want to spin the whole vehicle. And so you lose contact with Earth. Uh, you may tear apart the, uh, the fabric of your back. Uh, but what for me was much more of a problem was that you will tear apart the asteroid. <laughs> if the rock is fragile, if it's like a loose agglomeration, something like TC3, you're going to end up with a bag of rocks instead of uh, you know an asteroid that ast astronauts can go to. And uh, it was because of this criticism uh, that was raised early uh, that we started thinking about this problem. And I was wondering, isn't there a way to somehow uh, you know, do this right? This is sort of the information we have on the strength of asteroids. This comes from meteor observations. So these are, uh, if you talk about a few meter size asteroids, you're really talking about one of my objects. <laughs> this, this is the type of objects we are studying. We, lo we see these things hit the Earth's atmosphere. Uh, they are uh, they are very enigmatic. We've never seen one close up. Nobody, none of you have. Uh, there could be uh, interesting new physics in these rocks to be learned. Just like when we went to asteroid Itukawa, which was a sort of a hundred meter size asteroid, that thing was a lot smaller than any asteroid that had been visited before. And sure enough, suddenly this thing turned out to be a rubble pile instead of you know uh, something monolithic looking. And uh, that uh, led to a lot of new insights. So who knows, if we, see an S if we see one of these rocks that we are seeing coming into the Earth's atmosphere up close when it's still intact, everything is, we may find interesting things. And one of the more, in more important uh, interesting things is what is responsible for the inherent weakness of these rocks? Because when we look at these things coming in the Earth's atmosphere, they typically tend to sort of break apart. We see them fragment at uh, pressures of about 100 to 1,000 uh, kilopascal. And to give you an idea, if you touch your skin just gently, that is one kilopascal. <laughs> so 100 times that, and your rock falls apart. So um, these, these meteoroids, these small meteoroids, are intrinsically fragile. And this is an upper limit, because if the rock is really a lot frailer, <laughs> then as meteor astronomers, we have a hard time seeing that, because uh, the rock may fall apart <coughs> early on, but then everything just moves along uh, uh, with uh, it's just as one object before it really uh, starts separating and, and uh, breaks up the bigger chunks, the more strongest chunks. There's always a range of there's always a range of strength in these things. So uh, so asteroids are fragile, and especially if these things are rubble pile asteroids. This is sort of the information we have from uh, studying asteroids in space. Uh, this uh, you know asteroids are. Uh, Asteroids are a microgravity type of an object. Don't think about people visiting an asteroid as in, you know, walking on uh, an asteroid surface. That's not going to happen. <laughs> at, the, at, the, at the surface of an asteroid, uh, we're really talking about a micro g in terms of uh, gravitational uh, uh, acceleration. And so, uh, no walking, okay? <laughs> Uh, if your asteroid is, uh, is small enough, then even gravity is not the thing that holds the rock together. It's the Van der Waals forces between tiny dust grains. So we think that a lot of these rocks, especially the rubble piles, are sort of held together in this, uh, in, in this uh, concrete of just tiny particles that, uh, that attract each other by Van der Waals forces. And, uh, and that type of material can have a really low strength, as low as 25 uh, Pascal, for example. So this is some uh, uh, calculations by Dan Shears and collaborators where uh, he's arguing that asteroid TC3, just the size it is, four meters, could be, uh, and the way it was spinning, we sort of see it tumble in space, asteroid TC3 could have been an object held together with an internal cohesion of only 25 Pascals. So a thousand Pascals is touching your skin. <laughs> 25 Pascal is as much cohesion as there is in, a, in, in one of these asteroids. It's a lower limit, so something above that. So clearly, you know, we have four orders of magnitude uh, uncertainty in the strength of these asteroids. <laughs> and uh, and that's, that's fascinating. Okay, so we need to know and we need to learn about that because it's this sort of objects that is um, giving us our Chelyabinsk. The big impact in Chelyabinsk, you know, was a 20-meter-size object. We're talking about small, small things. 
So if you're talking about asteroid mining, and I just picked these pictures at random from the internet, do not think along these lines. This is just, you know, not real. <laughs> this, is this is not uh, the way things can happen. You cannot bolt a, a structure onto an asteroid. Uh, certainly not the asteroid that will be accessible to us in the near future because they're all going to be small. Uh, if you want to drag an asteroid uh, to the Earth by throwing cables around it and so on, chances are that debris is going to go everywhere and uh, it's going to fall apart on you. And so the first thing, the very first thing in our opinion that uh, we need to be doing is we need to figure out how to put an enclosure around an asteroid. We need to control this problem. We need to figure out how can we build, uh, how can we uh, prevent this asteroid from going anywhere if we handle it. And that brings me to, you know, a nice uh, sunny day uh, here in San Jose when I met uh, over a, a cup of clam chowder, Bruce Damer. Uh, Bruce is much more of a futuristic thinker than I am. Uh, Bruce uh, had these, he's a, he, he, he designs uh, space architectures and then develops these uh, fantastic digital products that show how uh, this might work in space. And uh, Bruce had this, uh, this wonderful vision about one day putting an enclosure around an asteroid to collect its volatiles. So what Michael was talking about, you heat the asteroid, water vapor comes out, and you use the water vapor as a source of fuel. I was a little skeptical, <laughs> um, you know. Uh, he, Bruce was talking about icy objects, and most of the asteroids that come anywhere near the Earth or in orbits that are accessible uh, don't have, you know, that much volatile. They certainly have no ices, and so uh, there is mineral water, but then you have to, you know, heat the rock, and uh, there's a less of it. And so, uh, you know, talking with him, I was, uh, you know, uh, being very amused and sort of listening to the stories. And then I was thinking, this is just, you know, not practical. This is not going to happen in my lifetime. But uh, then uh, I suddenly uh, realized that, hey, wait a second. If you can put an enclosure around your asteroid, then you can fill that enclosure up with gas. And uh, gas, I xenon gas to be specific, is the gas that is being provided by uh, uh, as, a, as a fuel to the ARM mission. So ARM was supposed to bring 10 tons or so, uh, Michael ch just mentioned 13 tons, of this xenon gas along so that you can uh, push the asteroid back uh, to uh, where you want it to be. So you can redirect it. If you can just spare say two tons of that xenon gas to fill up an enclosure around your asteroid, uh, then suddenly uh, you can de-spin the asteroid. You can stop the asteroid from spinning, uh, even you know when the asteroid is pretty sizable. So at the time they were talking about you know up to 13 meters in size. So if you have a, a, a rock 13 meters in size, you wouldn't need an enclosure of about at least 20 meters, 19, 20 meters. And then uh, you could fill that back with say two tons of xenon gas. What that does is it raises, uh, it creates an atmosphere of 0.1, it creates a, a, a gaseous atmosphere of 0.1 atmosphere of pressure. So we're talking 0.1 atmosphere uh, to work with. And turns out that that's enough to have your asteroid uh, create turbulence in the gas. And then with turbulent dissipation, and these were calculations uh, done by uh, Stu Pillars here at SETI Institute, he, he looked into this. Uh, with, uh, with turbulent dissipation, you can stop a TC3-like spinning asteroid, so something going around every 100 seconds, you know, uh, with a sort of a uh, spin kinetic energy of, you know, two times, two, a few thousand joule, you can stop this thing in seven hours if you had an unlimited supply of xenon gas. In seven hours, so very quickly, <laughs> for all uh, purposes. Of course, there isn't a lim limited amount of, there is a limited amount of xenon gas, so the asteroid will start um, uh, s uh, will will start putting angular momentum into this gas. So at some point, the gas will start rotating. It will start co-rotating, and then uh, s some of that will couple with your enclosure. So your enclosure will start spinning, but uh, at such a s at such a low rate that you can compensate with fuel. You can use your engine to prevent the uh, the enclosure from spinning. So what you're really doing is you're doing very, very gently, you're de-spinning your asteroid. This is the most gentlest way you could possibly do this. 
And so this is, this is feasible. And then uh, what you end up with is uh, none of this. So uh, you, you could actually have an asteroid that uh, is despun before you close your enclosure and before you try and grab it. Now, that uh, should keep con keep you con give you control over your vehicle uh, throughout the whole process so you don't lose contact with the Earth. And uh, you will, uh, uh, in principle, be able to bring that enclosure down very, very gently. Now, if, is that gently enough? That's a question. <laughs> so that was bugging me because you may still end up with a pile of rocks. But in that case, it would be a pile of rocks that would be treated more gently. So you may uh, have more of that original um, structure and you may have more information on how that or, or how the original pieces were, uh, were come together. So we think that this was a, a practical idea of doing it. Uh, we know it works because we've put 0.1 atmosphere of gas in balloons in the past. This was a, a balloon that was flown by uh, um, by, by Julian uh, Knott in, uh, uh, during his flight over Australia. Uh, Julian is our um, ballooning expert, uh, so he loves this idea of putting a balloon in space. <laughs> uh, really, uh, really strange idea. The, the concept would be very much like ARM. You would use air beams. Uh, you would sort of uh, uh, make a V-shape. You'd go over your asteroid, and then you could try and close it. Uh, the most difficult part of the whole exercise is how you would close the asteroid, how you would gas seal the asteroid at the other side. And so we do not know yet how to do that properly. We've come up with some ideas. You could use uh, some sealing fabric. You could use sticky silicone layer and so on to, to keep it sealed. But this is, this is the engineering problem of the future, we think. This, is, this needs to be sorted out. How would you, how would you do this sealing of the, of the asteroid? And, and there may be alternatives. I mean, rather than, you know, trying to seal it on the other side of the asteroid, you could sort of have two, of two vehicles and try and mate the two vehicles in the center. You know, that would be an alternative approach. That may give you actually also more control over your spinning. Uh, but, you know, um, uh, this, is, uh, this is something to, to sort out. So if it's possible to do this, if you can make it a sealed enclosure, then uh, you have a practical way of despinning your asteroid. Uh, you would... Um, you would want to have a little bit more control over your vehicle, so instead of having big solar panels sticking out, which can flex and, you know, it's a little bit dangerous, you would want to have uh, s solar, solar panels on your enclosure. Uh, you would have different albedos on different sides, so you could thermal thermally control your gas uh, inside and uh, all those things. So a lot of it turns out to be, you know, there are, pr there are ways to practically do this. Then, while we were sort of talking about this, uh, it occurred to me, you know, I'm Dutch. <laughs> we we uh, uh, are big in ships, and in the old days, you know, we used the wind to take us all over the earth. And the wind is an incredibly powerful tool. Uh, so it, it occurred to us that if you have gas in your enclosure, uh, if you could circulate that gas somehow, you could set up a wind, and you could use the wind to blow the asteroid. This would be the, the most gentlest of ways you could think of handling your asteroid. And it turns out that this idea is in principle feasible as well. You need to uh, make a, a way of setting up a flow in your, uh, in, your, uh, in your enclosure. So the concept we had is you, you uh, have an inner tent and then you have an outer balloon and the space in between you use to pump back the gas. And uh, it turns out that you would need to pump around two cubic meters of the xenon gas per second around. If you can do that, then you could set up a four-knot wind, so we're talking gentle breeze, and uh, aim that gentle breeze at a one square meter surface point on your asteroid. And that's enough to uh, take the force of the, of the uh, solar electric propulsion engine and push against the asteroid and push the asteroid uh, in front of you so that the ion uh, engine pushes the enclosure and then the wind pushes the asteroid. And that way, you're basically literally blowing the asteroids to the Earth-Moon system. <laughs> it's thinking outside of the box, but this is a, a really good way of, uh, of manipulating an asteroid. The cool thing about it is that you have con complete control over what you're doing with your asteroid. So y at all times, you know, you have cameras. You can set up cameras all the way around the asteroid. You can, you can look and see what you're doing. You can keep track of where everything goes. If you dislodge material, if dust comes off and so on, it's all collected in your enclosure at places. 
uh, this is uh, this uh, turns out it, that turns out to be also a way to control your enclosure because you can, in principle, control your enclosure with the um, with your armed vehicle, uh, but you can also uh, have high pressure vents and blow xenon gas into the enclosure as a way to you know uh, push off and uh, and keep the enclosure centered on the on the asteroid. So to for this to work, you need some pumps. You need to dedicate some xenon gas to your to this process. Uh, you need a computer system that uh, keeps your enclosure centered. And uh, you need a control system to know at all times where the asteroid is. So, so that would normally be a LiDAR system where you, where you measure the distance to the asteroid, but you could also maybe do it with the uh, various cameras around. So it it's comes from the ARM option A. It's a, it's a relatively minor modification of ARM option A. But it uh, gives you incredible ad uh, adventure. So this was sort of the, the way that we saw the cameras and vents systems. It gives you the big advantage that you can actually bring an intact, frail asteroid to the Earth-Moon system. And then, uh, you know, have the asteroids interact with something that is really uh, the type of object they, they may one day meet. Uh, as, as in the future, um, this type of an effort would really make asteroid mining possible, I think. If you, if you, first thing you need to figure out, how do you put an enclosure on an, uh, around an asteroid? Uh, this is a great exercise to go and start do that. Once you get your enclosure made, uh, the limits, you know, the possibilities are endless. Uh, one of the options, for example, is you can use gases now to do the mining. You can actually have uh, sort of corrosive gases react with the metals in a meteorite and uh, that way uh, collect uh, co collect metals from your from your object, uh, and you can then use those metals in a in a way to uh, do three D printing and you know make tools. So you know, cool ideas. Bruce's Bruce's concept of uh, collecting volatiles from a from an asteroid would work. You you have your sealed enclosure. That means you can now can heat the the asteroid, and uh, you can uh, then collect whatever comes out, and you can use that as fuel for uh, for for spacecraft, and uh, you know one of the coolest things is I think is what you're doing is you're create you're creating a habitat around your asteroid. You're creating a bit of, with a tenth of an atmosphere of gas or build it up to one atmosphere of gas. Uh, you can keep water liquid, and that means that you could drench this asteroid with water, and you could actually use the asteroid material itself as a substrate for growing plants. So if there are if you, if you can think of ways of of doing something with an asteroid that takes a hard time you know bringing all that rock up from earth but it, it already being there if that's an advantage then uh, this type of uh, putting an enclosure around the asteroid uh, gives you uh, all the opportunities to go and 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 use that utilize that so this is our little uh, you know uh, part possible part to uh, to the future something that we think is practical and uh, maybe that uh, the arm uh, mission efforts will uh, will lead to this, will point us uh, to this path, and ultimately will uh, make us use these asteroids for uh, for space travel. Thank you. Okay. So, questions for our speakers? Thank you. My question deals with these Van der Waals objects being exposed to essentially nothing for a while, and then suddenly they've got a tenth of an atmosphere of xenon around them. Xenon is inert chemically, but as a medium, I mean, are you? you it seems to me you're going to end up just with a bag full of dust, aren't you? Won't you disperse all the sort of d more or less destroy the Van der Waals attractions? I don't think you destroy the Van attraction, but you may affect its strength. And so this is said, yeah, this is so. This is uh, something that needs to be investigated and see, you know, what uh, what what comes out. That's a very good question. I I had one that's similar, kind of overlaps. Um, when you start the phase of the capture of the asteroid, and you start blowing stuff around, and you would blow regolith, obviously, some of it. Um, what, how would you keep track of the asteroid if, say, a lot of that dust settled on all your camera lenses and you couldn't see anything? 
Yeah, the, the nice thing is that uh, in for this problem, the technology has actually been developed. <laughs> so there are little uh, uh, electrostatic uh, systems now that uh, you know you you flip a switch and then poof, all the dust is gone in front of your lens. Yeah. So uh, so this uh, this this problem we also thought about and we realized that it, that the technology already exists. Okay. No questions. Are question came up, what is next? And it would seem that comets are going to be a target in the foreseeable future. Would an enclosure around a comet be about the only way you could bring back volatiles, I would think? I don't know if it's the only way, but it would definitely be a way. Yeah, the <laughs> It's interesting, uh, for example, what Rosetta is, uh, is doing at the moment is going to a comet when it's still far away from the sun, before it's really active, when its activity is low. At that stage, you know, you could put an enclosure around the comet, collect what you need, and then let the comet go. <laughs> um, you know, so uh, so there are yeah, there are uh, many possibilities here. If I can add to that, there are pro proposals for what we call cryogenic sample return from a comet. So you go out when it's much further from the sun than we are. All the water ice and maybe even the CO two is still frozen. You pick that up, you put it into a freezer, and you keep that box very very cold all the way back to Earth. This is a significant engineering challenge, especially if you want to bring it down to the ground, because you have to pack that freezer inside of a sample return container. But it has been suggested. So yes, in this case, you know, just like Stardust flew through the comet coma to collect dust, maybe this is a way to uh, easier way to collect the volatiles. Also, uh, it's asteroid day, and we have two asteroid guys here. So, if you have other questions unrelated to Arm or Shepard. Uh, this might be a good day to ask about asteroids in general. Is it practical to take a gas uh, chemotography device, you know, portable uh, size available now, and to be able to do the um, experiment there itself before even it comes to the Earth and something would be destroyed otherwise? And there are other uh, uh, source based, surface enhanced Raman spectroscopy based uh, um, diagnostic devices you can use to to get the volatiles or if there's any any liquid or any anything else, and that's available as a per thing, and <laughs> we can talk about it. Okay, there are proposals for doing lots of detailed in situ chemical analyses. I'm not aware of anybody doing gas chromatograph instrumentation for asteroid applications, but certainly there's been a lot of interest in the Raman spectrometers now that they're flight qualified. So when we'll, is to go to Mars in 2020, you can talk about doing that to an asteroid and doing detailed chemical analysis in situ. Okay. I'll ask a question. Um, so Almahata Sita. Um, the, uh, the one that fell in Sudan, that is a mixed bag, literally. Uh, so, how do you get that? What was the latest thinking? Uh, the latest thinking is that um, the the bulk of this asteroid was actually ur uralite, uralitic. So it's that black, scruffy stuff. Uh, only uh, sef seventy percent or so what fell on the ground was uralitic, but uh, but we think that originally a lot, much bigger percentage of it was. And the uralites come from a, a planet, uh, planetesimal that got really hot inside, but not hot enough to melt all the minerals. So it melted some minerals. They flew away. Uh, right at the point when it was that hot, uh, it, got, it got smashed by something else, and the planet shattered. All those, then pieces cooled very rapidly, so we see evidence of that in the rock. And then uh, those pieces came together again by gravity and rebuilt sort of this asteroid, if you like. Then somehow it migrated to the inner part of the asteroid belt, and there uh, it accumulated, we think, uh, these other types of asteroids. So we think that probably the percentage of these other types of asteroids more was more in the sort of the 1 to 2 percent range than, uh, than 30 to 40 percent as we saw it on the ground. But you know, still, it's still a lot of material to collect. And then this thing got hit again, smashed and created a, an asteroid uh, family. And uh, it's that asteroid family that's now uh, bleeding things via the resonances towards the Earth. Thanks. 
Uh, what's the um, uh, ratio between uh, iron-rich and carbonaceous uh, asteroids out there right now that we know of? So if you look at meteorite samples, you find that most of them are irons. This is a heavily biased sample for two reasons. One is the iron meteorites are relatively strong. They don't break apart into very fine dust anywhere near so much as the other ones that Peter mentioned. The other reason is that it's a lot more obvious that something is artificial. If you're walking around, you see a big chunk of steel sitting on the ground. So there's a very big collection bias. If we look at the asteroid population through radar observations, we can get a sense of the, which things are dense, very reflective to the radar, metal rich. And that's about 1 to 2% of the near-Earth population for larger objects. For smaller objects, we have less data, and it's not entirely clear if the compositions change with size. OK, so um, let's finish the public questions now. You can come up and ask the speakers if you have uh, any further questions. And as you s saw, there's plenty of issues about uh, collecting asteroid samples, and it would take lots of caffeinated be beverages before people sort it out. So here are the special SETI mugs okay. for experts to uh, you know, get caffeinated and think some more about it. Thank you. Thank you.